What Paul wants us to see is that our marriages are to the world around us a visual aid of the most extraordinary reality in all the universe. The reality of Jesus' commitment to us, of our union with Christ. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And uh, Jonathan, I think that is kind of a, a mind-blowing concept for some of us to think that marriage is actually a picture between Christ and his bride, the church. Yeah, it's not something that we would think up if it wasn't written there in the Bible for us. Right. But it's a very significant insight because it tells us that human marriage points back to and reflects a greater reality. And and it's it's profound to consider that. I think it's also very helpful on a number of different levels because for the Christian it it tells us, look, your marriage is about something bigger than just yourself. And even that basic insight, there's a kind of liberation that comes with that, I think. But it's very, very wonderful thought to explore. For the person who maybe has never heard marriage pictured that way before, I mean, this is a brand new concept for them. If they're coming and looking at this maybe from dysfunctional marriages that they've seen, maybe their own, maybe their parents' marriage that they've seen break apart, is there a way to, in a sense, redeem that image? Well, I think there are probably a, a few ways to think that through and to try and process that. And of course, that's the reality for many. There are lots of broken marriages around the place, and many listening to this program will have experienced a broken marriage in their family or their own their own family or some kind of dysfunction within within marriage. And that's a heartrending thing. I think one of the one of the perhaps most comforting aspects of this to consider is that if you are a believer and you have experience of a broken human marriage, the wonderful gospel truth is that in Christ you are a participant in the great marriage, and in eternity you will have enjoyment of that perfect, unblemished, and unbroken marriage. That, that's one wonderful comfort to draw from all this. Well, today we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. So if you can, I hope you'll grab a Bible. Join us there as we begin a message called Honoring Christ in Marriage. Here is Jonathan. Well, I think we'd all agree that Christian teaching is normally countercultural. All aspects of the Bible's teaching present some level of contrast, some level of challenge to the prevailing winds of culture and of society. But certain aspects of Christian teaching, certain areas of Christian living, well, they sound entirely alien to the worlds in which we live. And today we dive together into a passage that seems almost to come to us from another world and seems almost to address another people. And for many of us here, whether committed Christians or those exploring the faith, we will share something together of a sense of discomfort. A big part of us might prefer that the Bible's teaching on this particular matter were not quite so countercultural, were not quite so radical. And some will wonder, no doubt, whether this model is actually right, whether this teaching still applies. Before we dive in too far, I think we need to consider together how we are to read and receive teaching like this. We need to consider our broader approach, and I think there are a couple of things we need especially to take into account. The first thing is that I think we should expect Christian teaching, Christian ethics, to be radically countercultural. In fact, if we read the Scriptures and found that the Bible's teaching just reflected the culture, just parroted what the world around us is saying, we should start to feel really quite concerned. Just remember, after all, what Paul has told us about our culture, about where we have come from. Back in verse 8, he said this, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Our natural state is a state of moral and spiritual darkness. And for society apart from Christ, that is the ongoing reality. But having been redeemed by the blood of Jesus and filled with the Spirit of God, we have now become light. We are, as Paul says, children of light in this very dark world. As we come to the Word of God, we should expect to be radically challenged, profoundly stretched. 
And actually, when you look at the mess that marriage is in in our society today, when you look at the divorce rate, when you examine the sheer volume of misery that is associated with broken and dysfunctional marriages, well, the reality is that we desperately need a word from heaven on this subject. We need it because what we've got going on in society generally with respect to marriage, well, it ain't working all that well. And if the Word of God has something radical to say to us, something profoundly countercultural, something deeply challenging, well, we need to hear it. We need to be ready to receive it. That's one thing. The other thing is this. We need to remember that we are not actually free to pick and choose what parts of the Word of God we will accept. This can be a real temptation for us when we come up against parts of the Bible's teaching that just seem hard or uncomfortable or even a little bit strange to us. So we look at this whole business of submission within marriage and we think, wow, you know, that is just out there. That is just strange. And so, I, I know, here is what I'm going to do. I am going to accept the bigger kind of drift of the Bible's teaching that God made us, that God redeemed us in Christ, that we need to believe in Him and have faith and that kind of thing. I'm going to accept all that, but I'm going to use my own discernment here and just filter out some of this more unpalatable stuff, and I will have my own kind of redacted version of Christianity. Or we do the slightly more subtle thing of saying, well, the Bible isn't wrong exactly on this. I'm not going to reject its teaching per se, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a good look at this passage here in Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm going to examine it. I'm going to see which elements of the passage are actually culturally contextualized, historically conditioned, and which now I can really quite legitimately set aside because the times have changed. You see, the Apostle Paul, well, he was, he was a man of his time, a day of his, uh, a man of his age. And maybe a part of what he's saying here in this passage just reflects his world and its expectations. Uh, you know, he was reflecting a time when it was just normal to think and say strange things like this. So I'll accept the spirit of what he says, you know, that marriage should reflect Christ and the church and so on, but I'll have to update some of the details myself. Now, that sounds highly intelligent and entirely sensible and so on, but here's the difficulty. Paul doesn't actually give us the space to do that. You see, he grounds his argument not in culture, not in his time, not, not in his place, but in far bigger, far grander realities. He grounds his argument in creation, as we will see, and he ties it to spiritual realities, even the reality of Christ and his union to his church. When we step far enough back from the particulars of a discussion like the one we're going to have this morning, we realize pretty quickly that the whole issue is essentially one of faith. It is actually a very basic and a very foundational issue. Either we are and will be a people of the book, a people who respond in repentance and faith to what God has said to us in His Word, or we are not a people of the book. Either we accept that God's Word as a package is right and is true, or we reject it as a package. And at the end of the day, it won't actually make coherent sense to say, I accept what the Bible says about Jesus living and dying and, and rising again, but I, I won't accept what it says about X or Y or, or, or Z. I'll accept the message of salvation to be sure, but what the Bible says about a particular subject, well, I'm, I'm maybe not so keen just there. So as a people of faith, as a people of light and not of darkness, we approach God's Word on this matter on the nature and the pattern of marriage, and we expect to be really stretched. We expect to be surprised, and we commit ourselves to accepting what the Word says and living in the good of it. So then what actually does the Word say? What is the biblical pattern of marriage for those who are children of light. Well, this whole section, you'll notice, falls under the banner set out in verse 21, which says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
Because we revere Christ, because we're thankful to him for our salvation, because we fear him aright, here is what we're to do. We are to show submission in relationships in the ways in which he calls us to show submission. Now, that doesn't mean that we're a chaotic people, all submitting at the same time to one another so that there is no leadership. No, this will be an ordered submission, shaped by context, determined by God-ordained roles. But we are a people who, in principle, are ready to show submission, even though it goes against our sinful instincts for self-assertion. And we'll show the kinds of submission that Jesus calls us to. And within that framework, shaped by that attitude, we find that there are specific principles that God sets out for us in marriage here in chapter 5, for children and their parents, for employment and so on as we get into chapter 6. Paul has some very specific instructions here for wives and for husbands, and we want to walk through those in some detail. But woven right through the passage, as you'll have noticed as we read it, Paul sets before us a bigger framework for our understanding of marriage, for where marriage fits into the plans and the purposes of God. He paints for us, if you like, the very big picture. And I think we need to start on that level if we're going to make sense of his specific instructions here. For staff here at the church at a, at a social event that we had some time ago, one of our team introduced a little activity. Perhaps you've done this kind of thing before. Each person is handed a, a picture out of a stack of pictures. All the images in the stack relate to one another. They're uh, increasingly zoomed in elements of actually one single big picture. And once we all had our individual image in hand, the aim of the game was to try and arrange ourselves in order of magnification so that we'd have the most zoomed out portion of the image uh, at one end of the line and the most uh, zoomed in uh, at the other. Now, I can't quite remember all the details. I don't quite remember what I had. Uh, maybe it was like a label from a Coke bottle or something in my picture. And what you discover as the game kind of goes on is that the really big picture, the fully zoomed out picture, is on a vastly different scale from the smallest. Again, I don't quite remember the details, but the, the big image, it was perhaps a picture of a child sitting next to a, a, a box with a jigsaw puzzle in it. And on the cover of this box is a picture of a billboard next to a road. And on the billboard, there's a picture for a cruise ship, like an ad for a, a cruise ship. And on the cruise ship, on the deck, there are people there kind of relaxing and enjoying a, a meal or whatever. And, and there's, there's someone there drinking a bottle of Coke. And I've got like the label of the Coke bottle, minuscule, but part of a much, much bigger whole. And the more you get of the big picture, the smaller you realize your part is. Now, when it comes to the Christian life, we only get the right perspective when we see that our individual lives and challenges and our opportunities form part of a much larger whole. The universe is not about me. It's about God. I'm not at the center of the universe. God is at the center of the universe. And so we need to see where we fit in within the larger whole. And Paul has a very big dose of the very big picture to give us here in Ephesians chapter 5. Throughout the chapter, Paul ties this reality of marriage to a much, much bigger reality, the reality of Christ and his union to his church. That happens really throughout the, the passage. And at the end of the passage, he drives home the point and he really summarizes it, verse 32. This is a profound mystery, says Paul, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Well, that is a mystery, and it is profound, but what Paul wants us to see is that our marriages, for those who are married, our marriages in our little lives in this little part of the world, our perhaps unremarkable marriages consisting of unremarkable people, our ordinary marriages are to the world around us a visual aid of the most extraordinary reality in all the universe, the reality of Jesus's commitment to us, of our response to him, of our union with Christ as the church of Christ. You're listening to Encounter the Truth of Jonathan Griffiths, and we need to pause the teaching right here, but you're listening to a message called Honoring Christ in Marriage. It's part of a series from the book of Ephesians called The Unsearchable Riches of Christ. 
And really today, we've been taking a look at how Christian teaching really should be expected to be radically countercultural, and how we're not just free to pick and choose whatever part of the Bible we like the best that we want to apply to our lives. No, as uh, followers of Jesus Christ, we need to apply all of God's Word to our lives. And we're going to continue to take a look at these truths in just a moment. But if you ever miss a broadcast or you join us late or have to leave early, I want you to know you can always listen to each and every program by coming to our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. You can stream a program or download an MP3. Again, the website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. All right, let's get back to the message. We're in Ephesians 5, so join us there if you don't have a Bible open already as we continue honoring Christ in marriage. Here is Jonathan. Our marriages in our little lives, in this little part of the world, our perhaps unremarkable marriages consisting of unremarkable people, our ordinary marriages are to the world around us a visual aid of the most extraordinary reality in all the universe, the reality of Jesus' commitment to us, of our response to Him, of our union with Christ as the church of Christ. Now, that is the really big picture. And with that in mind, Paul has a great deal to say to us about the practicalities of marriage. He has clear instructions both for husbands and wives that he wants us to hear and to heed. He begins by addressing wives. Verse 22, notice with me. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, verse 22 is really the point at which the preacher is tempted to run for cover. This is not altogether popular teaching, you may have gathered. Many of us will wince just a little as we read verse 22. And faced with the potential awkwardness of it all, one option is to find a way of suggesting that the text does not say what it appears to say. And there have been plenty of those texts, those, those attempts rather, not very successful on the level of text handling as far as I can determine. Another approach is to deftly set the principle aside with a number of witty little anecdotes. You've probably heard all of these before. The, the couple determine when they marry that the husband will be responsible for all the major decisions, and then he quips, in 35 years of marriage, there hasn't yet been a major decision. <laughs> or, or another favorite, the husband, yes, he may be the head, but the wife is the neck, and she has the capacity to turn the head. And on it goes. I think there's probably a book of those things somewhere published to help preachers of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. But anecdotes and distractions aside, Paul does seem actually to mean what he is saying here. He seems actually to intend that a wife should submit to her husband's leadership. Later on at verse 31, Paul is going to take us back to Genesis and to ground his teaching in the creation order itself. He'll quote from Genesis 2 and remind us of the very institution of marriage at the time of creation. And it's significant for us in this passage to remember the dynamics of creation in marriage. You'll remember man and woman in Genesis 1 and 2, they're created equal in dignity and in worth, both equally in the image of God himself. But within that equality, there was a differentiation in role even there. Adam is made first. Eve is created from his own body as a helper for him. That's the language that Genesis uses. And Adam is given the unique opportunity and responsibility for naming Eve. Now, that's the original design. That's how things started. But the entry of sin came with a confusion and even a distortion of those roles. The story of the fall has at its heart Adam's abdication of his responsibility as loving and protective leader, and it has at its heart Eve's desire to steer the situation herself. And as we all know, it all goes horribly wrong. 
And so when we come to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, and we see this call here for the wife to submit to the leadership of her husband, what Paul is actually doing is calling us back to the creation model. He's showing us what it will look like to be children of light who are redeemed from this dark world, who live out something entirely different and distinctive, something that can actually work and can actually bring joy and harmony because it's actually what we were made for. It's actually the Creator's design. And so the call here is for the wife to submit to her husband just as the church submits to Jesus Christ and to do so, verse 24, in everything. Now, the principle is clear enough from what Paul is saying, but the practicalities, as we all know, can be very challenging. There are a whole host of thorny issues that Paul doesn't even begin to touch on here. I mean, let's be honest. What about the abusive husband? What about the unbelieving husband whose leadership within the marriage and the home is just ungodly? What about the husband, and this is perhaps the most common situation, the most common problem in the church, I fear. What about the husband who just abdicates leadership, who is just kind of passive and uninvolved, whose leadership couldn't really be followed because he doesn't really lead? Now, as we think about this call, we can't help but think of painful and difficult circumstances where living this out looks well nigh impossible. We need to acknowledge, don't we, the pain involved in broken and unhealthy marriages, and we need to acknowledge the very real challenges in living this out. And we need to honestly acknowledge, too, that we don't have all the answers here. Paul gives us some key principles, vital principles, but he doesn't deal with all the complications. Now, recognizing all that, being honest about all that, there are two things at least that we need to consider and bear in mind. First of all, Paul makes it clear that the basic motivation for this command is not tied to the husband's worthiness to be respected as a leader. Paul doesn't say, man, these Christian husbands are such shining examples of leaders. How could you not submit to their leadership? It's just so wonderful. Now, he says something entirely different. He says, submit, verse 21, out of reverence for Christ. See, the reason that believers will seek to be submissive in marriage, at, at, at work, toward parents, and so on, the reason is not that we think that all Christian husbands or employers or parents are great leaders. It's fundamentally because we regard Jesus Christ and want to live His way. It's because we belong to Him. It's because we care about His reputation in the world. It's because we see that our marriages relate to something bigger and more wonderful. They reflect the union of Christ to His church, and we want to bear witness to that reality in a true and a faithful way. Well, that's where we have to pause our teaching today. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths a message called Honoring Christ in Marriage, as we're taking a look at Ephesians 5 today, really focusing in on verses 21 to 33. Maybe you joined us a little bit late and you missed the beginning of this broadcast, or you just want to go back and listen to it again, you can always do that by visiting our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. There you can stream the program or download an MP3. Again, our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported ministry. We depend on your generosity to keep this program on this station, but as you give a gift of any amount, we want to say thank you by sending you a book called Checkbook of the Bank of Faith. It's written by C.H. Spurgeon. And Jonathan, what did you love about this book? Well, we're so delighted to be able to make this resource available this month. Charles Spurgeon is one of the most famous preachers actually in the church's history, I think. He was a a wonderful pastor and Bible teacher in Victorian London, and he led a very significant ministry there. And Spurgeon had a genius for taking simple truths through God's Word and applying them to the hearts of believers. And these daily readings, I believe, will nourish your heart and soul, whether you're new to reading the Bible or whether that is a long-established pattern for you. I think you'll find this of great benefit and encouragement. The book is called Checkbook of the Bank of Faith. We'd love to send you a copy as you give a gift of any amount. All you have to do is come to the website 
EncounterTheTruth.org, or you can give us a call at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884. Or again, the website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, thanks for listening today, and I hope you'll join us next time.